This is John Abrams, your host and that guy that interviews successful variety artists from around the world every single week. I can honestly say that this is by far the biggest celebrity I've ever interviewed. You'll know what I mean when he answers the first question. I first met George a few years ago. Uh, we hung out at a fair near his hometown. And I got to tell you, I've never seen people react the way they did when they saw George. Almost every booth we went to, almost every walkway we walked, everywhere we went, there were people yelling, hey, George, hi, George, look, it's George. You're about to meet one of the nicest guys you'll ever meet. He's one of my favorite people. Enjoy. Everything that I do is real. Some of it's real, real. Some of it's real fake, but it's all real interesting. Welcome to The Variety Artist, providing aspiring artists and entertainers with in-depth discussions from top performers from all over the world. So get ready to book some gigs, make some money, and have some fun with your host, John Abrams. He's not your average giant, billed as the world's tallest sword swallower. He's been in Ripley's, performed on The Tonight Show, been featured in major motion pictures, appeared on CNN, The Learning Channel, The Travel Channel, and so many more. Recently, he was seen in American Horror Story. Variety artist, I give you George the Giant MacArthur. Whee! <laughs> How's it going, George? Doing good. I, I'm happy that we finally got to be able to do an interview. Me too. I, I don't get a chance all the time to interview friends. I'm kind of excited about this too. Now, for people who can't see you or have never seen you, describe yourself, your physical stature. I am a George the Giant. I stand at around seven foot three in my prime. Because of my back and everything else, I'm probably around seven one, seven two now. Only seven one, seven two? Yeah. I'm a, I'm a petite giant. <laughs> I've been performing for uh, almost 30 years doing uh, the old time sideshow. Before we get into the sideshow, we're going to get into a lot of that stuff. You're seven foot one, two, three. Yeah. How tall is your wife? My wife is four foot ten. <laughs> I always wanted to go home to the little woman. So now I do. I love seeing pictures of the two of you together. It's priceless. I don't even realize it until we walk by something with a reflective surface. <laughs> so we'll be going by a mall. And all of a sudden, I look over and see a a, a window, and I'm like, oh, my freaking word. No wonder (laughs) everyone stares at us. (laughs) Were you born a big kid? Or how how did that work when you were growing up? Okay, supposedly I was a normal size at birth. But I was always tall for my age to the point my mother carried a copy of my birth certificate with her because a lot of places you had to be so so young to be let in for free or whatever. So she would have my birth certificate to prove I wasn't 12 or 14. I mean, when I was eight years old, I was taller than my teacher. And after that, I was always taller than my teachers. So you'd go to the movies or something and, and your mom would say, Oh, he's, he gets the 12 and under rate and you're like six foot three or whatever you were they would give her grief. And so she'd have the birth certificate to prove that I was nine years old. (laughs) Wow. Oh yeah. It was, it was weird. I mean, there is a story in my childhood. One of the reasons why I do libraries is I have a love for libraries because it was my sanctuary. One reason why it was my sanctuary. When I was uh, eight years old, I transferred schools And so I was in third grade, and the first day there, I got beat up by uh, three sixth graders because they thought I was a sixth grader. Oh. And so they attacked me because I was so much bigger than them. They did three on one. And so from then on, I would try to hide. I would go to to the library for safety. And then that's where I fell in love with books and reading and everything. Wow. So before we get into your libraries, because we are going to get into the libraries, yeah. you do all sorts of stunts. Tell, tell me about the different stunts that you do. When I started, I started out with uh, fire eating. Then I went, learned about blockhead, which is hammering a steel spike into your skull. Learned glass walking, 
beds of nails, sword swallowing. Then I've learned eye lift. I learned uh, strongman stunts from uh, hammering a nail in a board to ripping a phone book in half, crushing cans with my hands, slamming cans on my fingers, animal traps, rebar bend off the throat. Wow. Learning to walk on hot coals. I got to the point where it was like when people ask about tattoos, how you can't just have one. It's the potato chip theory. You have one potato chip. You want another. You want another. I was that with Sideshow. Once I learned one stunt, I had to learn something else. Uh So I just kept teaching myself by talking to other performers, reading old manuscripts and figuring out what parts of the manuscripts were uh, true information and which ones were trying to get you killed. Wow. Well, I got to tell you, two years ago, I was watching one of the Christmas parades on TV. And all of a sudden, I'm like, wait, there's my friend George. Yes, that was the weirdest (laughs) show to get paid to do the Ripley's part of the the Christmas parade that was filmed uh, on Hollywood Boulevard. Yeah, that was just the weirdest (laughs) job. We filmed it like right after Thanksgiving. Uh, (laughs) It was just like we we rehearsed for like three days and then the actual performance. It was great. Oh, you rehearsed that for three days? Yeah, because how long was the actual performance? Oh, uh, the actual performance was, I think, four minutes. Oh, yeah. Four or five minutes. Basically, it was because they there was all these parts, and they had to get they they had us lip syncing to the song. They had us doing kind of almost dance moves, and it was like <laughs> it was the weirdest it was the weirdest show to do, but it was quite entertaining. And it's like I've watched it on every every Christmas or every couple of months. It shows up on my Facebook feed. Yeah, And it makes me laugh because I'm like, it was fun and it was a paycheck. That's right. Always good when it's both. (laughs) Yeah. Now you're doing well right now because of COVID, nobody's doing lots of libraries, but you were before COVID doing tons of libraries, right? Yeah. Library shows became a uh, love for me. I had been performing for uh, years with a business partner and I needed to walk away from that situation and I wanted to do a single low. I was contacted by the Fresno library system because they wanted to do something for the teen program. Mm -hmm. They wanted something for the teenagers that wasn't for just kids because they felt like the teenagers didn't want, want to participate in the activities because there's all these little kids running around. And I understand that, but at the same time, you kind of want to, to mix it and not stop kids from seeing the show because I had some libraries, they would only let the teens see the show. If they were under 12 years old, they weren't allowed to see the show. Oh, the teenagers didn't know that. So there was only like five people at the show huh. when you had it with the teens and all ages that wanted to come. I had like 120 people at a couple shows. My viewpoint was it let the teenagers know they could they could laugh or could gasp because the kids did it. So it was okay for them to do it, too. Gotcha. Those teens, when you do something, they look at it a lot of times. They'll look at each other like, should I laugh? Should I not? Should yeah, I? Because it's a peer pressure. If, if my other friends aren't, if no one else is laughing, I can't laugh. Right. And they're all looking at each other. They're all wanting to laugh or they're all wanting to react. But since there isn't one person doing it first, none of them will do it. Right. It made it difficult. But the thing is, because what I was doing was so different than a a puppet show or a story time or bubbles. When you walk into a room, the teenagers go, oh, it's not a little kid's show. Yeah. It's not for the four-year-olds. When they saw the bed of nails coming in, I had a lot of teenagers that weren't going to go to the show. And they even told me, they were like, oh, yeah, we weren't going to go. But just the stuff you brought in, we had to see what it was. Yeah. I thought that that was really cool. And it was like, I started out with the Fresno Library System. They were like, we need someone to do a show. We want something different. 
So I came up with a show that uh, wasn't too uh, freaky and wasn't too dangerous. I didn't do any fire uh, at the libraries. And I had some people go, why? I said, well, fire and books don't match. That's right. Uh, they just don't go together. Sprinkling systems and books. Yeah, don't go together. So yeah. I was like, I never did fire there. I, and no one missed it. I had one library have me go outside and do a fire blast. Mm. Because they the posters had me eating fire. They grabbed photos off my website. And fire photos are really cool looking. Yeah. So they would post those and then they would feel bad that I wasn't doing fire. And I'm like, um, I gave them a list of what I was doing. Yeah. Not only that, but most, most librarians frown on the fire thing. Actually, most public places indoors public places don't want to deal with it. Yeah. It's, right. it's a safety issue. So when you're doing libraries, is there a message or something you're, you're trying to convey? You know, when I started, it was just the history of Sideshow. I wanted people to see uh, how Sideshow has gone into TV and movies. But then it started going into my life. When I was a kid, I was judged because of my height. I had a lot of problems for that. And so I started realizing that I wanted a show to talk about being different. I wanted people to know it was okay being different. It didn't matter if you were tall, short, black, brown, white. It didn't matter if you were a diabetic. It didn't matter if you had seizures. It didn't matter that you were the tallest kid in your class every year of your life. <laughs> you have to learn from what's inside because I believe that we all need to accept each other for being different and go on with our lives. Because if we don't start accepting each other for being different, this planet's not going to survive. It's not easy. Some people are still buttheads no matter what they are. <laughs> but you still have to get along and not let the other stuff stop you from getting along. Awesome. I got contacted by the Fresno system and they wanted 10 shows in five days. Hmm. So I arrived on Monday and I did two shows a day until Friday. Hmm. Uh, oh, sorry. I did a I did an 11th show for uh, Elkhorn, which was a juvenile boot camp. What is that? What it was, it was basically a boot camp for juvenile delinquents. Oh, okay. They, they had a choice. They could go basically into a juvenile hall, a, 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 a juvenile, juvie prison where they're not doing anything, or they could do something that could try to change their lives. It was basically a military school. Hmm. Most of the people that went through the system, very few went back. Mm. And then they got defunded. So they closed it. But I always donated a show for them. I was like, you're getting, I said, I'll do uh, whatever libraries you want. And you get two free shows. One of the free shows is already taken. And they would always go, what? I go, it's going to Elkhorn. And they're like, oh, great. Because we'd love you to do Elkhorn. And I'm like, so you get for uh, how many shows you're buying? You get one free uh, library and you get the Elkhorn uh, yeah. library for free. That's a great way of selling it, too. For those of you out there that do libraries, I mean, eight paid ones and then two free ones. Great idea. We'll get off the library thing because I, I, I love doing libraries. You know, I could talk about that all day. But oh, yeah. what, what started you off on the sideshow journey? I mean, I know your size and it's kind of a natural fit, but. Yeah, the, the, the first statement is when you're my size, you have two choices in life. Play basketball or be a freak. And I hate sports. <laughs> the story to sideshow is interesting. When I was eight years old. I fell in love with magic. I saw Doug Henning on oh, yeah. TV. As I tell everyone, every generation has their magician that they're going to remember being in their life. Right. And Doug is mine. The way he looked at magic was uh, really different. The trick was good, but it was how he reacted to it is made you enjoy the trick. So I started doing magic. And then later on, I got bored with magic because I didn't feel it was real. Mm -hmm. When I was 12 years old, 
I went to the Kern County Fair and on the ballet stage was a performer doing sword swallowing and fire eating. I saw my first sword swallower and fire eating when I was 12 years old. And I was amazed at what the human body could do because to me, that was real magic. It was really happening in front of you. Well, when I first saw sword swallowing at the very, very beginning, I really thought they were fake swords that collapsed. Well, that's what my brother told me. My brother had told me sword swallowing was fake and Mm -hmm. fire eating was fake. And so I went to the books and started reading about fire eaters and sword swallowers and found out, yes, you could fake uh, sword swallowing, but there are ways to prove that it's real. And the way the guy was doing it, I was pretty sure it was real. That made me rethink magic. Then I started doing escapes because I still wanted to do magic and I wanted to have something that was semi-real that took skills. Yes, you can gaff a lock. You can change the way a chain works by loosening a uh, link and fixing it so it breaks. But that wasn't how I was doing it. I bought my first straight jacket by having it made custom for me at a canvas shop. Mm. The people that make tents made my straight jacket and I had a really thick canvas. I've had people try to get out of my jacket. If the jacket fits on you correctly, there is no way in heck you're getting out of it. Oh, yeah. I, I don't mean to interrupt, but I have a straight jacket story. <laughs> okay. What's your straight jacket story? <laughs> okay. So I used to do a straight jacket escape, probably not as cool as yours, but I, I so I met uh, Tommy, you know, Tommy Lee of Motley Crue, the drummer from Motley Crue. Yes. So I'm doing his kid's birthday party. I decide to do a straight jacket escape at the very end. And we're doing it right next to a pool. And when I was a kid, I was a competitive swimmer. So I thought to myself in my head, I thought, well, I'm a competitive swimmer. I'm not going to drown because I, I can figure out how to get up, even in a straitjacket. So I said to Tommy, I said, I said, would you like me to, to, uh, to jump in the pool with a straitjacket on? And he said, yeah, we have a lifeguard. Yes, we do. Okay, no problem. So I have the whole audience countdown from 10, whatever it is, I jump in the pool thinking I'm going to plummet to the bottom and try to escape, hold my breath, and then jump out to a huge round of applause. Well, the straight jacket fills with air. Mm -hmm. I float to the top. I look ridiculous trying to escape out of a straight jacket on the top, on the surface of the pool. And finally I get out and and throw the straight jacket into a, a, a smattering of applause. And that was it. <laughs> well, I was expecting you to just have problems because once the canvas gets wet, it's really hard to get out of it, too. That is absolutely true, too. I did do a water escape one time because I was doing the chain escape. I did an, uh, an Australian insane muff, and then I would do 50 feet of chain on top of it. Oh, yeah. And I had someone toss me in the pool, and I had to concentrate on staying down there. That's right. For as long as I could before I got out because I wanted it to look really cool and I wanted people to panic. Yeah. And I was just like going, how long have I been down here? Because it's like your mind, once you go in the water, you don't always think the way you think you're going to think. Right. I felt I was down there for a minute and a half. I was told I was down there for like 25, 30 seconds. <laughs> <laughs> and I was like, I got out of the change real fast because I knew how to do it. But it was like, I kept trying to tell myself, I can't get out yet. I can't get out That's yet. right. I, yeah, that's a similar story to my straitjacket escape. You keep thinking, I should stay down here to panic people a little longer. But Well, I did an upside down straitjacket jacket escape with the 50 feet of chain. And when you hang upside down, well, now all the directions of where the chain were are different. So I'm trying to stretch my body to keep the chains from falling off of me while they're hoisting me up. And I'm like moving around 
and it looks like I'm trying to get out. And I'm like, I'm not. I was just trying to keep the chains on as long as I could. And then when I started getting out, I started to move and the chains just basically fell off me and caught me on my throat. Oh. And so I was like in a position of, oh, that kind of sucked. So I had 50 feet of chain, basically. Most of it was on my neck. And I'm like trying to get out of the straight jacket going, okay, I now have to get out of the jacket before I stop breathing. <laughs> well, as long as we're telling stories, you have some good celeb stories uh, oh, yeah. of, of, of crazy things you've done with some celebs. I have two stories that are my favorite. One of them is I got paid to do a uh, banquet for Homes for Humanity, the group that President Carter is a big fanatic for. This gentleman comes up to us and goes, look, President Carter is here. Now, this is after he's already left. He's no longer the president, but they still have Secret Service. Says he is going to be at so and so table. You are not to go near him. If you pull a sword, if you do this, you will be tackled. Wow. And I'm like, okay. But we're basically told if we go near him, I pull my sword out for sword swallowing, I'm going to be killed. Okay, that's fine. I don't want to have him tackle me while I have a sword down my throat. That would be a bad thing. Bad. We're doing the banquet. I'm keeping an eye on his table. I'm making sure I'm like two tables away from him at all times. A lady comes up to me and goes, uh, hi, uh, we would like you to perform at our table over there. And she points at the President Carter's table. And I look over and go, well, I'm happy for you. That's not going to happen. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> and he, she goes, what? And I said, I have been informed by the Secret Service that if I go near that table, I'm going to be tackled. And I said, and I'd prefer not to die a horrid death with a sword down my throat. And she goes, no, no, you don't understand. President Carter wants to see you perform. So you will perform at that table. What do you do? I'm like, okay, could you try to remind the Secret Service not to attack me then? And she laughs at me and goes, maybe, and walks off. <laughs> So I go over, I do the sword swallowing, paranoid. I, I have never swallowed a sword and was scared as much as I was because I just kept an eye of where everyone was sitting, where the people that were standing that looked like they could hurt me, where they were standing, if they moved. But I did the whole thing with no problem. And then I did a thing called the balloon trick, which is you put a, a, a 260 balloon, you blow it up, for those that are not balloon artists, what's a 260 balloon? How big is it? 260 is a very long, narrow, pencil-shaped balloon. And so you blow one end up, make a small bubble, and then you thread it through your nose, out your mouth, and then when you squeeze it, the bubble pops out on the other end. It's really stupid. And I'm sitting there staring at the face of President Carter while I do this, thinking, this man had the power of nuclear warheads. And I'm doing this stupid stunt in front of him. A balloon in your nose. <laughs> yes. It was just the most bizarre experience. Out of all the people I performed, he's the one person I regret not being able to get a photo with. Oh, yeah. I would have loved to have had a photo with President Carter. It never, it didn't happen. But yeah, that was one of those, that it was just so funny. It brought joy to my heart. The other one that's really something special to me is I did a miniature movie with Alice Cooper. Hmm. I have already done a couple movies. And I've done other stuff. And you're basically told if you're an extra or even a, a glorified extra that has a little bit more power than just a face in the crowd, you still don't really ask for autographs or anything to that effect. But when I left to go to New York to film it, I had stopped off at a toy store and bought two Alice Cooper action figures. I was like, well, if I can do it 
I'll ask him to sign it because it would be cool. It would mean something to me because I have a friend that's a big fan and I would love to have one for myself. So I hauled it to the thing. I had it in my dressing room. That At one point, we had to wait for cameras to reset. And so we sat basically all huddled on the ground while Alice Cooper sat on a throne. Oh. Him and me ended up talking about touring and golf. <laughs> I know nothing about golf. I tried golfing once. The idea of chasing something that small around did not bring joy to my heart. Okay. This man made me want to go golfing. His love for golf is so cool. You fall in love with what he loves. Wow. And, and then him talking about farting in the uh, tour bus was hilarious. Okay, wait, wait I, I got I to gotta hear at least a part of that story. Well, yeah, we were talking about touring, and I said, yeah, I said, I, I love it that you can go number one, but you can't go number two. He says, oh, yeah, you don't want to do that because it stinks up the bus. And trust me, <laughs> when you have enough people in there, they're farting enough to make it stink. And he goes, and then you start doing it on purpose, hunting for foods to fart with. <laughs> the idea of Alice Cooper's hunting for the, the types of food to make him fart the best is just something that just makes you go, okay, I can almost picture this. So at the end, near the end of the show, one of the makeup artists had VHS copies of the Muppets, the one episode that Alice Cooper was in, and he had got it signed by Alice. Well, the makeup artist knew I had the action figures with me and supposedly told Alice about it. All of a sudden, uh, Alice's uh, helper comes into my dressing room and goes, uh, Mr. Cooper wants to see you. Okay, so I walk in and Alice goes, I hear you have action figures. I go, well, yeah. And I go, but I just wasn't going to bother you. He goes, do you know how upset I would have been to have left and found out you had those with you and you didn't have the guts to ask me to sign them? Wow. So... He uh, signed the signed the action figures. He let me take a picture with him pulling a sword out of my throat. Fifteen years later, he came to Bakersfield to perform. A friend of mine had backstage passes. She brought my photos with, with him. And I had two photos, one that I signed. They brought the other one, handed it to Alice to sign. He looks down and goes, oh, George, is he here? <laughs> Pardon the interruption. We're experiencing some technical difficulties. Continue listening. We'll have them fixed in just a minute. So, George, you've done a lot of libraries, but you've also done a bunch of amusement parks. How did you start out with that? When I uh, started performing with a uh, troupe called Shock Value, we were doing uh, street performing at Universal Studios CityWalk. They decided they were bringing back Halloween Horror Nights. Mm -hmm. They did it for two years. An incident occurred that made them stop doing it. A monster died by a tram. Wait, what, what happened? Supposedly, one of the monsters that was in the King Kong section fell and got ran over by the tram. Oh, my. And so they stopped doing Universal War Nights in Hollywood. They decided they were going to bring it back. And they wanted a freak show. And they saw the stuff we were doing. They had us audition. They said we had the job. And then we just never heard back from them. So we were waiting for a contract, waiting for a contract. My business partner finally got a hold of them. And he said, oh, we ended up giving it to someone else. This other guy who, who's been in Sideshow for years and knows what he's doing, he's doing it. But we told them about you. And he wants to hire you. So this was Bobby Reynolds? Yes. Okay. The old guy was Bobby Reynolds, one of the uh, old-time sideshow owners, the world's greatest showman. Went on the road with him. He had basically told me how to swallow a button that's tied to a string, and then once it's swallowed, pull it up to, to loosen up the esophagus, one of the sphincters that are in there to kind of break it open and loosen it up. 
told me about using a coat hanger, how to bend it, how to swallow that. And I just couldn't get the coat hanger down. It would stop. Mm -hmm. uh, he goes, have you put the sword down yet? And I was like, no, I can't get the coat hanger down. And so he just starts screaming at me, shove it down your freaking throat. Shove it down. What are you? <laughs> Useless. And next thing I know, the thing is down my throat. Your body is really special. Your body has safety mechanisms. If you put your hand in fire, guess what normally happens? Yeah, you, you pull your hand out. Your hand out of fire. You shove something down your throat that should not be down your throat. Your body wants to get rid of it. So it starts to cave in on itself and bend over. Luckily, I had done some research on it and kind of knew about it. So I fling the coat hanger out of my throat before I bent over and had twisted the coat hanger. So that's how I swallowed my first coat hanger. <laughs> and then once I knew I could do it, I started practicing. For the week and a half in Amarillo, I was swallowing a coat hanger, eating fire. Since my throat was just getting used to everything, I'm having Coleman fuel dripping down my throat. And I wasn't eating that much because uh, part of the agreement was he was to feed me two meals a day. What he didn't tell me was the meals that he was going to feed me were bologna sandwiches. Mm. Now, that's not great as it is, but the refrigerator is powered by the main hub of the carnival. Okay. Which is turned off at one o'clock in the morning and not turned back on until one in the afternoon. Okay. So if you open the fridge during those times, all the cold is going to leave. Basically, the baloney will go off after a couple of days. I had food poisoning by the end of the run and I was sick. And I was still doing around 30 shows a day. Uh, One thing that I learned with doing 30 to 40 shows a day is either you get really good or you realize this is not what you want to do for the rest of your life. Going on the road with a sideshow made me a better performer for later on in life. Uh, yeah, I was talking to a psychologist or a psychiatrist uh, just the other day. I said, we're kind of in the same field. And she says, well, what do you mean? I said, well, uh, I have to sum up an audience within or, or a person or people within two or three seconds. And she sums up people over time. Yeah. <laughs> so, so both of us are looking at crowds or people and trying to figure out whether they're liking it, whether they're disliking it, whether they're scared, whether they're happy, whether they're depressed. You know, we have to sum it up. But we, have, we as entertainers have to do it like that in a split second. I base my show on a roller coaster. A roller coaster will throw you around, make you scream, make you cry, and make you laugh all in a two to three minute period. And when it drops you off, it basically leaves you exactly where you were, just a little bit spent. I love making people laugh and then have them realize, oh my gosh, he was doing the most disgusting thing in the world, but I was laughing at it because he made it so much fun. I've seen you a few times. It, it, it's absolutely true. That's my job. You invented a trick though too, right? Yes. I invented a stunt called crazy straw where I would wrap a straw around a, a audience member. Then I'd put one in up my nose, out my mouth and then drink milk. And so the milk would go around the person like a crazy straw. It's based off of Blockhead. It's based off the balloon trick that Todd Robbins made famous. It's a nose trick. It goes up the nose, out the mouth. But when I came up with it, it was because I was working amusement parks. I was going to Denny's at like two in the morning after the shows. And some kid was making a big deal about not getting a crazy straw with his meal hmm. and my part and i kept looking at it going that would be hilarious to have something turning and twisting and my friend goes dude it's very much like blockhead and the balloon trick that you already do he says 
you just have to get some tubing, I guess. And so the next day I was at Home Depot picking up tubing <laughs> and coming up with a stupid stunt. Now you've been performing for a long time, but right now you're transitioning into a museum of some kind. How does that work? Or what is that all about? Well, I've been performing for around 30 years. I've been touring during that time and I started collecting things because I love the sideshow. I fell in love with the sideshow when I was 12 years old mm -hmm. and meeting Bobby Reynolds and working his uh, museum. I was the only live act. Other than that, he had all these other exhibit pieces. He had the Fiji mermaid. He had an alien. He had a lot of weird and strange things. And I fell in love with the stuff. So when I'd be on the road, if I saw something weird, I'd buy it. Mm. Friends of mine started realizing I loved the stuff and I was being gifted things. I was gifted a uh, ventriloquist figure that supposedly is haunted. A friend of mine gave me a two-headed animal. So I started collecting this stuff and I've been wanting to show it for years. And my wife was like, you know, you have all this stuff. You need to do something with it. And I have this little pipe dream of getting a big toy trailer. Uh -huh. And I was going to go to fairs with all the uh, oddities in the trailer. But my wife was like, why don't you just get a storefront? I started looking at pricing of how much a storefront would cost in Bakersfield. And I walked into a friend that was doing a pop-up art museum. The museum comes up once a month at this little location. You get to see all the artwork and you can buy it if you want. She had been doing it for almost a year. I was like, that's a great idea. I just come in, set up for a few days and leave. I'll be like a dark carnival. Mm -hmm. I pop up and then I'm gone. I talked to her thinking she owned that spot. And she goes, oh, no, no, I lease it from the theater. It's the Fox Theater. And I was like, okay. So I talked to them. And they're like, oh, this sounds great. So how much would it cost to rent the thing? I, would, I just want to be open on the weekend. I don't really want to be open during the week. And I want to be open for like two weekends. And they're like, we have a spot in October that would be perfect for an oddities museum. And I'm like, no, no, no. I, I was thinking like in a few more months. And they're like, no, October would be great for a strange <laughs> oddities museum. So basically, I had a month to find all my uh, exhibit pieces that I had scattered throughout my house and storage sheds and find cabinets and so i rushed to build this museum to be open for two weekends i was open on fridays and saturdays we had lines that were around the building because i was only charging five dollars because my thought was i wanted a whole family to be able to come and not be broke you already described a couple of items what other items are in your museum or what can somebody expect to see in the museum I have a portrait that was done in dryer lint. Oh, I have carvings done on matchsticks. There's bottles that are painted from the inside. Wow. There's little tiny bottles. The paintbrushes are put inside and they do the painting on the inside. I have two headed animals. I have a two headed calf that's real. I have objects that supposedly are haunted i have a bell that belonged to a medium in from new york that after she died the bell would go off oh i have a monkey that belonged to a child and after he passed the family left the room exactly the way it was and then one night they heard the uh, monkey going off they woke up to smoke and found out the house was on fire oh I assume it's a stuffed monkey or a, a mechanical no, it's monkey. The, it, it's the monkeys with the, the symbols. Oh, okay. The symbol monkey. So they heard the symbols and got the heck out of Dodge. Mm. Then I have like roadside attraction items like the uh, killer bats. The, the females are around a foot long, but the males can be three feet long and can uh, take a man out in three strikes. Mm -hmm. And then you open up, it's a baseball bat. <laughs> okay. You have the killer, rat, the baby rattlers. 
and you open up and there's baby rattles inside a box. Mm -hmm. We had the man eating chicken. People would go see the man eating chicken. What is that? It, it, it was a 300 pound man sitting sitting at a table eating chicken. <laughs> the terror of Kentucky, the man eating chicken. Okay, so not only is it odd and crazy, but it kind of has a sense of humor at the oh, same yeah, time. Oh, yeah. The old roadside attractions are just things to make you laugh. And then you have the freaky stuff like the, the two headed baby in jars, uh, nature's mistakes. A lot of weird and strange things that I, I collected. Well, how can somebody find out about that? If someone from across the country wants to travel and, and see your oddity museum, how, how, how will they find out when you pop up? I do go to rent fairs and do it. I've gone to comic cons and do it, but the Bakersfield one is the, my favorite one because I get to bring everything out. I have a page on Facebook called Georgia giant strange museum of oddities and wonders. So if you just type in George the Giant Museum, it usually shows up. And I'm always posting weird jokes, weird facts, anything strange to keep the page. And then when the museum's coming up, all that information comes up. Nice. So if someone comes and, and visits the museum, will you personally be there? I am one of the exhibits. I have to be at the museum. If I'm not at the museum, it's not George the Giant Strange Museum. Because I always did a perform, I would do performances almost every hour. I would do some type of stunt. I did have write ups for a lot of the exhibit pieces, but what I have information in my head isn't necessarily all on the paper. Mm -hmm. So I could tell a story about the object or why I have this object. Like the chupacabra I own, I was working a show. A gentleman came up to me and said, uh, my uncle has this object that he obtained. Uh, I'd love to show it to you. And I thought it was the weirdest thing in the world. I was willing to pay a dollar to see it. So I bought it off of him. So this farmer was working in Texas. This thing jumped out in front of him. He did what any God-fearing man would do. He ran it over with the tractor. Okay. He had a shredder on the back because he was collecting cotton. He found part of it that night and a part of it in the mouth of his dog the next morning. Uh, Preserved it using polyurethane, shoved it into a display case. I ended up buying it off him. He says it's a chupacabra. I let people make up their own mind. I have one guy say it's his cousin Lester. Another person said it was his ex-wife. You never know. (laughs) Uh, One person said it was a rabid gopher. I don't know what it is. All I know is it's 100% real strange. Well, those are the great stories. So when someone comes to see your museum and they get George, that's what you want to hear. You want to see the item and then hear the story. Yeah. And then I also had an ego section, which was different things from my uh, career. The sword that was made for me from a big giant sword. Some of the props from different movies I've been in, like the chain. And the sign, Colossus from Big Fish, a program that was used for the circus scene in uh, Touched by an Angel that I was in. I have my Vogue, my Vogue modeling debut photo there. Oh, is it, is it, that's, that's the sexy portion of the. (laughs) You you would think that, (laughs) but no, uh, I basically am holding a ladder and I have a hat on. (laughs) Uh, They hauled me all the way to New York. Got me a suit and everything else. The one photo they used, I'm wearing a t-shirt, pants, and I'm holding a ladder. There's no reason for me being there. But (laughs) I got paid. I ended up getting a a suit out of it. Sounds like a fun thing. (laughs) Yeah, it was the weirdest job I've ever done. Are, Are you ready to do fact or something John just made up? Sure. Let's do that. Let's do a game. Let's do the game. Is it fact? Or is it something John just made up? Ah. Here's what's going to happen. I'm going to give you one, two, three. I'm going to give you a few headlines. You tell me whether it's true or not. And if it is true, tell me a little more about it. How's that sound? Okay. All right. Are you ready? Let's do it, Freddie. (laughs) First headline. George learned fire eating to overcome a fear.
Yes. Tell me about that. When I was 21, a gentleman broke into my brother's home, tied him up, lit him on fire, oh and my. left him to die. He survived, but left him with a fear of fire. I'm very close to my eldest brother. It left me with a fear of fire. I'm one of these idiots. I'm scared of heights. So I bungee jumped. I decided to learn fire eating. I had already done the research on it. So when I got back to Bakersfield, I started learning fire eating to overcome my fear of fire. Wow. It's a little bit hard to say during a library show, but <laughs> it's it's the perfect story because, well, number one, it's true. Number two, you're a little vulnerable in it. Oh, yeah. It was one of my fears, and I decided to break it. And my brother goes, I really wish you wouldn't do it. It scares me every time you do it, but he loves it at the same time. <laughs> All right, second headline. George entered Nathan's famous hot dog eating contest on Coney Island six times in a row. Oh, man, I wish I could say yes, but that is no. I haven't even been to Coney Island yet. Every time I plan on doing it, something has stopped me from uh, taking the, the the train over. I would love to see that. I'd love to see all these people lined up and there's George. And the... <laughs> That'd be great. The joke is I'm not that big of an eat. I do eat, but I'm not a competition eater. I've tried and it just never works. Those guys are crazy. Is the records like 70 hot dogs or something? One of the records was done by this girl that is like five foot three. It's crazy. All right. Third headline. George worked for the TV show Fear Factor because of Boy Scouts. <laughs> you know, that sounds false, but it is true. Oh, I taught wilderness survival at Camp Kern for the Boy Scouts of America. When I was doing an amusement park, they wanted a geek act. And I told them I wouldn't bite the heads off of a chicken or a bat, but I could probably eat live insects. So we came up with an act that I called garden sushi, which was me eating crickets and worms and what have you. Well, one of the producers for Fear Factor saw me and like a year to two years later, when they started Fear Factor, I got a phone call. Mm -hmm. So I would go to the office with different insects and show them how to eat them properly. And then I would come to the site three days later and supply all the bugs that the uh, contestants would eat. <laughs> hey, hey, multiple sources of income. <laughs> Yeah, well, you know, you have to find stuff. And so so I got paid to do a demonstration, and then I'd be paid to supply the insects, and then I would be uh, paid to also be there as a uh, supervisor to make sure the insects were treated well and that the people were okay. <laughs> that was Fact Ooh. or something John just made up. Ah. Well, that, that was that was fun. Thanks for doing my show. That was really, really fun. You know, I've been wanting to do your show, but I never thought you'd want a sideshow freak. So I never asked you to put me on the show. I want you to know that uh, I've loved listening to your stuff. The world is going to lose a uh, very useful bit of knowledge from all the people that you have done interviews with. It's great that it's out there. And yep. so I know that you're working on your uh, teaching of magic as an after school uh, program. Yep. I think that's a great idea and you're going to need to put all your time into that. I hope the best for you and for the children that learn from you. Thank you, sir. I really appreciate that. That, that warmed my heart. <laughs> Thank you. And I can't wait to see you down the lot. Yep. Every time we uh, see each other, we always have a blast. Yeah. And we always eat. For some weird reason, we're always eating. Yeah, we do always eat, don't we? <laughs> All right. Before I let you go, do you have any social media or anything you want to promote before I let you go? I have georgegiant.com. Um, I'm on Facebook. 
with the museum page. That's the one I love the most. I'm on Instagram, the real George the Giant. Thanks to all my variety artists. Tell you all your friends about the Variety Artist Podcast. Now go out and book those gigs, make some money, and have some fun. That's all for this episode of The Variety Artist. But your journey continues on our website. Go to thevarietyartist.com for more strategies, insight, and resources, as well as show notes on today's guest to assist you in your career. We'll see you on the next episode of The Variety Artist. But until then, go out and book those gigs, make some money, and have some fun.